body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my producer, Joel, in the building with me. And today we are covering one of the sickest, probably most evil individuals we've covered so far on this show. And that is Peter Scully, also known as Australia's worst pedophile. A really, really dark one today, and I gotta just up front say this one is very disturbing. So if anything surrounding pedophilia and sexual assaults, especially with children, disturbs you in any way or triggers you in any way, I highly recommend you do not listen to this episode because it is definitely very dark and very disturbing. And reason for covering it is just, I think it's important to know about these individuals that they do exist and they are out there and they unfortunately do prey upon people through the internet. So I think it's better to know about them than to not know about them. But before we even dive into that whole mess, I wanted to remind everybody that I just launched a new show called Planet Sleep. So when you're done listening to this episode (laughs) and you need a full cleansing of the mind, (laughs) definitely go check out the first episode that just dropped this week of Planet Sleep about the Amazon rainforest. Oh yeah. And I promise you, it will make you feel so much better and hopefully you completely forget about everything you just heard in this episode. For sure. It's, it'll definitely put your mind at ease after watching it. So. It does. It's it's absolutely relaxing talking about the beautiful Amazon rainforest, all the animals and plants and life that exists within it. With lots of nature sounds like rain, thunder. Yeah, Joel put some serious all work into it stuff. to really create a a beautiful masterpiece of of just everything that is the Amazon. It's it's really really good. We're very proud of it and yeah. very excited for you to hear it. If you haven't checked it out, we'll put all the links for Planet Sleep below. But this episode of the podcast is brought to you by HelloFresh, Cabby Insurance and Vivino. So, oh man. I almost don't even want <laughs> to even start down <laughs> this, this one's going to be bad. It's, it's very rough yeah Um, it's it's very dark this is one of the topics that i think just hits the hardest because anytime you're talking about children and just just sick evil people out there that that do these things to children it is almost it almost defies just everything i mean it just defies being a human i mean at that point you're an absolute monster and that's who peter scully is he's an absolute monster this guy's out of australia and some even call him the world's worst uh, pedophile and, and you'll see why here in a second but the surface web is a part of the internet that's visible and available to everyone and this is the place where all of us visit websites we use search engines we check our email we post on twitter but it's not the only layer of the internet that exists. There's also a place called the dark web. And this part of the internet is much, much different than what you and I access every day. Partly because it can't be easily accessed. Users hide behind encrypted software, aliases. And again, it's just more difficult. You have to have a special client in order to even, there's several steps you have to go through to even connect to it. It's actually not as hard as you would think Uh, If you really want to seek out the dark web, it's really not that hard to to get onto. But once you're on there, it can be a very, very scary place where criminals and online predators often communicate with one another anonymously. I mean, that's the main thing about it is it's the perfect place for all these sick and evil people to hang out because they can do all these things and criminals can run their enterprises completely anonymous. People on the dark web are involved in selling organs, believe it or not, illegal weapons, obviously tons of drug trafficking, human trafficking, and even contract killings. The dark web can't be regulated by the government and users are difficult or nearly impossible to trace. The most difficult criminal activity to track on the dark web is unfortunately child pornography. A recent study found that about 80% of activity on the dark web is related to pedophilia. This activity is so hard to track because users usually trade their content for free. So there's absolutely no money trail or cryptocurrency for authorities to follow. The worst of this material is known as hurt core. 
a genre of child pornography that involves adults inflicting pain and sexual torture on children or children being forced to inflict pain on themselves. Absolutely disturbing and disgusting. The only motivation for those making and trading these materials is to watch an underage person suffer through pain and humiliation. Offenders use encrypted email addresses to target victims and then blackmail them into taking pictures or photos while they do horrible things to themselves. These victims are forced to do things like eat dog food off the floor while stripped naked or lick a used tampon or toilet brush. They're also forced to hold up handwritten signs that say things like, I am a slut, and racial slurs while posing naked with their legs spread apart, exposing their genitals. Sometimes the sign will include the alias of another online predator, and once it's uploaded to the dark web, this serves as a form of tagging or a call out to that user. Similar to how people tag each other in photos on Facebook or tag each other on Instagram. And these signs can also serve as a way to prove who uploaded the content first as it's traded around the dark web, giving them credit as the original blackmailer. One thing that makes these sites so dangerous is that they're not for casual viewers. To be a part of these communities, everyone is required to upload their own content and users challenge each other to upload the most graphic materials. So they like egg each other on to try to post more shocking and graphic content. Users post on forums requesting certain materials, things like young girl being used as a dartboard or child's bones being slowly and deliberately broken. It's really hard when you hear these things. I know for me, it really is hard to just wrap your head around the fact that this is real, that this is not just some sick movie. This is literally real life and real human beings that are doing this to other young and innocent human beings. I mean, it's just, it just blows your mind. It really does in, in the worst way possible. They chat about things they like to see under subjects like toddler child porn star, three men and a baby, and even butchered babies. These videos may even be live streamed with viewers calling out requests in real time for how to inflict pain on the victim. And once predators enter this world, their sickest desires are normalized because there's a whole group, a whole community of people who think just like them. Extreme hurt core involves an adult torturing an abducted child and toddlers and babies aren't off limits. The most extreme form of it all is a snuff film, which is just basically a video of somebody murdering somebody else. Most crimes are committed for reasons investigators can understand. Motives like revenge, hate, passion, sex, power, or money. But the motivation behind Hurt Core is literally just to watch another human being suffer and ultimately die. But where there is a market, there will always be someone profiting off of it. In 2014, a user who went by the alias Lux came across a paid Hurt Core video series called Daisy's Destruction. Lux, also known as the king of Hurt Core, ran a popular website on the dark web called Hurt to the Core, where thousands of users traded Hurt Core content. But Daisy's Destruction couldn't be shared and viewed by just anyone. It cost $10,000 to view all four parts, each about 10 to 15 minutes long. Daisy's Destruction was notorious on the dark web and the surface web, and people on forums and chat sites discussed the video and what was allegedly in it, trying to figure out if it was even real. If someone admitted to seeing Daisy's destruction on the surface web, they were admitting to a serious crime. So it was impossible to separate facts from speculation. But there were rumors that this video series depicted several babies being tortured to death. A hammer and a chisel were used to crack a baby's skull. Another baby was disemboweled. Adults slammed two babies together as if they were having a pillow fight until they were both deceased. A young girl was allegedly defecated on and the excrement was smeared over her body and then her limbs were chopped off by a machete and her throat was slit. Based on these rumors, even people in the Hurt Core community thought Daisy's destruction took things too far. It was available for purchase on a dark web website called No Limits Fun or NLF which was also a production company. Whoever owned and operated NLF was making a lot of money selling Hurtcore on the dark web. 
The videos on the site featured abducted children being tortured by adults, and for a premium price included a live stream feature to watch the torture sessions in real time. Lux apparently didn't like that Daisy's destruction was so expensive and inaccessible to most users. He also thought he could use it to drive more traffic to his own site, so he uploaded all four parts of Hurt to the Core and made it free to view. And the video somehow went viral on the dark web, and soon it's made its way onto the surface web in several European countries. And for the first time, there was proof that Daisy's destruction was real. It wasn't just this urban legend. One of the adults in the videos seemed to be using Dutch words, which caught the attention of the Dutch National Child Exploitation Team. And they opened an investigation immediately and started working to identify the adults and children in the videos. It's still not known what exactly happened in Daisy's destruction. The only people who have viewed it are criminal pedophiles and investigators. And because the victims are young children, the details have never been released to the public. But there are a few details that are likely true. There are three adults in the video. A white man operated the camera and directed, and his face was pixelated to hide his identity. He was directing two young women, maybe teenagers with darker skin, and they wore masks over the top halves of their faces. The women followed the man's instructions to torture and rape two young girls and a baby. The girls were 11 and 12 years old, and the baby was only 18 months old. Again, warning of caution, this is very, very disturbing and very graphic. But basically, a baby was hung upside down by her legs while the women tortured her. Devices that looked like alligator clips were used to torture the girls. Whips, hot wax, a lighter, barbed wire, and various sex toys were featured in the video, along with a tank of water large enough for the girls to be fully submerged. They were beaten and raped repeatedly and forced to perform sex acts and acts of violence on each other and on the baby. They were then given shovels and instructed to dig a hole, which they were told will be their own graves. And each part in the series just gets more and more violent and graphic. And the Dutch police knew this video had been circulated around the world, and they had no idea where it was made or where the victims or perpetrators might be. Police departments from several countries were brought into the investigation. Usually, there would be tension between departments, maybe even competition. But this case was different. Everyone united behind the common goal of finding the victims and prosecuting these sick and evil perpetrators. Since they couldn't trace the video or track down the users online, they had to use traditional detective work, studying still images from the videos and listening closely to the words and accents. The adults all spoke English, but the women had thick accents. The man was likely from an English-speaking country they found, and they believed the victims were impoverished children from the Philippines, and the two women were also likely Filipino. It turned out, though, that the man wasn't speaking Dutch. Paul Hopkins, an officer from the Australian Federal Police, or AFP, was the first to recognize the man's accent. It was, in fact, Australian. This individual's identity was well hidden online, but they believed he was somewhere in the Philippines. The AFP got to work right away trying to connect the suspect to unsolved cases in Australia, while the investigators in the Philippines, led by Agent Janet Francisco, gathered leads for where he might be hiding out. The Australian Federal Police found a case of a serial fraudster who fled the country before he could be charged. And the details matched up. It looked like this could be their guy. His name was Peter Gerard Scully. And he was born in Melbourne, Australia on January 13th, 1963. Peter had a very uneventful childhood and seemingly led a normal life. In his late 40s, he was living in Nair Warren, a nice suburb in Melbourne with his wife and two children. He worked in real estate and did very well. He was wealthy and smart and well-liked by his colleagues and friends. But in 2009, he caught the attention of Australian Securities and Investment Commission, and they opened an investigation and linked him to 117 cases of fraud and deception relating to real estate scams. In fact, he had scammed multiple Australian investors out of over $2.68 million. By 2012, they were ready to charge him. But Peter, knowing that they were onto his scheme, 
had fled the country in 2011. Later, investigators discovered he had been running an illegal escort service in Australia. He was selling a Malaysian teenager named Ling for suburban sex parties, sometimes leaving her with his clients for days at a time. He also ran a website advertising her services. In an online forum, a client wrote, Well, apparently anything goes for this girl, for the right price. In one incident, Peter had gotten angry at Ling and locked her outside completely naked. But he referred to her as his girlfriend, so investigators thought he may have fled to Malaysia. Once they linked him to Daisy's destruction, they focused all of their efforts on the Philippines. According to police data, the Philippines is one of the top 10 producers of child pornography in the world, and predators target children in poor and impoverished neighborhoods who are desperate for food and shelter. I mean, how sick is that? Literally taking advantage of these poor children, just who are looking for basic rights as a human being, to have a roof over their head and a meal. And they use that against them in order for them to do all of this sick content. So twisted. For these freaks online. That's yeah, so sick. It's, it's the scary and sad reality of, of human trafficking and sex trafficking that this actually does happen. But parents sometimes willingly handed over their children to a stranger who promised to give their child an education and opportunities for a better life. Peter Scully also used the aliases Peter Riddell and Peter Russell. And investigators believed he kidnapped impoverished children and used them to create videos to sell on the dark web or for live stream torture sessions. His primary customers lived in Germany, Brazil, the UK, and the US, but the market is worldwide. For several months, they followed every possible lead, and investigators from multiple countries traveled to the Philippines to assist the local authorities. They narrowed the search to the city of Cagayan del Oro on the island of Mindanao and desperately search for Peter Scully, his accomplices, and the young victims. And finally, in January 2015, they caught a break. 18-year-old Carmarin Alvarez was one of the mass women in Daisy's Revenge, and she had been taken in by Peter when she was just 14 years old and groomed to become his accomplice and his sex slave. He treated her like his child and his girlfriend at the same time, but her most important role was with his business, his production company, no limits fun in december 2014 peter told carman he wanted to adopt two young girls and he told her to go out and find a 12 year old and a nine year old who needed a place to live carman tried to talk him into taking her younger sister instead but peter refused so before she left he warned her not to come back until she found exactly what he wanted she ended up finding two cousins who were the right ages and they were both poor and hungry and living on the streets these girls have gone by multiple aliases to protect their identities, but the 12-year-old has been called Rosie and the 9-year-old Queenie. Rosie and Queenie agreed to go with Carman mainly because they were starving and she promised to feed them. They were then brought back to Peter who fed them as promised, but then things took a turn. The girls were forced to take off all of their clothes and Carman bathed them while Peter took pictures and videos. The next morning they were given shovels and told to dig, and while they were working, Peter told them that they were digging their own graves while filming their horrified reactions. That afternoon, things escalated again, and they were forced to undress and perform sex acts on each other. After this, Peter then raped both girls. One of them was screaming so much that Carman covered her face with a pillow, nearly smothering her to death. The girls were raped and tortured for five days, and on the fifth day, Carman found them chained up and wearing dog collars. After willingly helping Peter torture them, she suddenly felt guilty, so she removed the chains and collars and let them go. Rosie and Queenie didn't run away and hide. They bravely went to the police and explained everything that had happened to them. After that, Carman was arrested, and Peter was once again on the run. At this point, investigators had identified 15 filming locations for Daisy's destruction in five different houses. They had meticulously matched up tiles, windows, stairs, and other details frame by frame. The three girls in the video were identified and again given aliases to protect their identities. First, they found 18-month-old Daisy, and she was miraculously alive and back with her family 
recovering from what would have been a lifelong medical problems from the torture she endured. Then they found 12-year-old Liza. She had been given to Peter by her mother, who was trying to care for seven children on just $2 a day. Peter promised to give Liza a good education and said with him she would have a bright future. But just two weeks later, her mother got worried, and she prayed and said God told her she had to get her daughter back. By the time Liza was rescued, she had already been severely beaten and raped repeatedly. And like Daisy, she will have lifelong issues from the physical trauma she endured. And sadly, 11-year-old Cindy was still missing. After Cindy's mother died, her aunt was struggling to care for her. A woman who called herself Lovey, likely Carman, offered to adopt Cindy and give her a good home. For a year, everything seemed to be going well, and Cindy's aunt was in regular contact with Lovey. But then the call stopped. Lovey had changed her phone number and address, cutting off all contact with Cindy's aunt. Agent Janet Francisco, who was leading the investigation, held out hope that they would find her alive. But sadly, that wasn't the case. Carman told investigators she was sorry for her involvement and wanted to help, and she led them to a house that Peter had rented in a southern city of Surigao and showed them where Cindy was buried. She had been raped and tortured and then forced to dig her own grave. Peter then strangled her to death with a rope and buried her beneath the floorboards in the kitchen. Carman claimed she wasn't there when Cindy was killed, but Peter had told her what had happened and where she was buried. But then finally, on February 20th, 2015, Peter Scully was located in Malaybalay City in the Philippines, and police officers stormed the residence and finally arrested this monster. Before we go any further and talk about the fucking downfall of this fucking terrible, terrible human, I'm just going to take quick break and we'll be right back. There are hundreds of companies out there claiming to compare auto and home insurance rates, but there's only one who actually does it. Get a better insurance with Gabby. And I know it because I've done it. Gabby is the one true comparison platform with fast, verifiable quotes and not just ballpark guesses. You can use your current policy to find a better policy comparing your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Progressive, nationwide, and travelers, all in one place. You use your current insurance information to get started, and best of all, it's free, and they only show policies that are the same or better than your current coverage, and many of them at a lower price. In fact, Gabby has helped me make sure I'm getting the best rate on my insurance. I went through the process. It was extremely simple. It only took a few minutes and they've got all the different insurance companies plugged right into it. So it's, it just syncs up. They get all the information you need. It's not like you gotta go type in a bunch of information for them. And then they go and do all the searching for you. It was super easy. And when it came back, I was very happy to see that I'm getting the absolute best rate for my insurance policies. So even if it doesn't find you discounts, which usually it does, but it'll at least tell you if you're getting the best possible rates on your insurance. In fact, Gabby's customers save $961 per year on average, and they'll never sell your info, which I absolutely love. So by doing this, you're not going to get a bunch of robocalls, a bunch of spam. So put your policy to the test like I did and get a better insurance with Gabby. It's totally free to check out and there's no obligation. Just go to Gabby.com slash lights out. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash lights out. Again, check out Gabby.com slash lights out today. It's free. I'm not a huge wine drinker, but every now and then I like to enjoy a very nice glass of wine, especially when I'm eating a delicious dinner, whether that's some chicken parm or a juicy, delicious steak, but I'm no expert. I like what I like, but I also love to try new varieties. Wines my local stores don't carry especially, and that's why I use Vivino. Vivino is the world's biggest online wine marketplace, and they're also the largest online wine community with 50 million users who have rated and reviewed just about every wine. Favino will also suggest exciting personalized recommendations based on your taste. So based on what you like, they'll create more recommendations for you. And a lot of these wines I never knew existed. And now I know even more about what I like, all thanks to Vivino. And their app is everything you need to know about wine and so much more right in your hand. Again, you can see all those ratings and reviews and you can leave your own 
and of course even buy wine right from the app. My favorite thing to do is to scan a bottle when I'm shopping in store and see what the Vivino's users say about it. One of my favorite things about Vivino is the fact that you can go to their pairings tab at the top of their website and you can choose what you're eating. And based on that, they give you some of the most popular selections for wine that people like with that particular type of food. And I found a delicious wine out of Italy to pair up with my delicious steak I had the other night. So I've really stepped up my wine game thanks to Vivino. So give them a try. And I know you're going to love it too. Just go to Vivino.com slash lights out and use code lights out at checkout to save 20% off on your first order of up to $200. That's V I V I N O dot com slash lights out and use code lights out to save 20% off your first order of up to $200. Again, that's Vivino.com slash lights out. Make sure you use the code lights out to get that discount and see site for details. Terms do apply. And our last sponsor for today is HelloFresh. I absolutely love HelloFresh. Been a customer of theirs for a very long time. And literally, I don't even know if I would eat without them because I just don't have time in my busy schedule and busy day to plan out a menu, go to the grocery store, and then come home and cook. And then whenever I do do that, I end up spending way too much money on all the ingredients and I end up wasting tons and tons of food. So with HelloFresh, they make it super easy. I just go online. I get to pick from their wide range of different types of meals and recipes they have. I get to pick out what they want and then they ship it all in a beautiful box right to my door. And I love that they're eco-friendly, everything's recyclable. And from there I can make a home cooked meal in 20, 30 minutes or even less sometimes and have something absolutely mouthwatering and delicious on the table in no time. What I also love is that this summer HelloFresh is everything you need to get grilling. I absolutely love to grill, love that charcoal grill I've got. And they've got grilling bundles for you. So burger pack, surf and turf, you name it, they've got it. And HelloFresh is even a better deal than shopping at your local grocery store. In fact, it's 28% cheaper. And God, if you use any of the delivery apps for food, it is so freaking expensive these days. So HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than not only a restaurant meal, but some of those delivery meals as well. And best of all, I love that HelloFresh lets you stop and start your subscription as needed. Maybe you're going on a vacation. You don't need the food delivered that week. Easy. Just pause your subscription and pick up when you get home. So if you haven't tried HelloFresh yet, I don't know what you're doing. You will quickly find out why it's America's number one meal kit. And right now, if you go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut14 and use code LightsOut14, you'll get 14 free meals plus free shipping. I mean, what a deal. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut14 and make sure you use code LightsOut14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shipping. All right, let's get back into the downfall of this monster, Peter Scully. So the cops just raided his residence. They've got him arrested and they started seizing all of his electronics, including hardware, memory cards, and cameras. They also found the chains and dog collars he had used on Rosie and Queenie. And God, there were countless hours of horrifying video investigators had to go through to try and locate more victims. That is a very tough job to do, to be a investigator in this type of world. I don't even know how people do it, but thank God there is people that are willing to put themselves through that in order to try and help other people because even seasoned detectives with years of experience working child abuse and murder cases cried when they viewed this footage. The law enforcement officials who worked on this case are still haunted by the videos of the torture that they had to watch. Investigators believe that there are anywhere from eight to 75 more victims out there either alive or dead and that Peter may have held some of them captive for years. But his arrest wasn't the end of No Limits Fun. Peter had another accomplice, the second masked woman. 19-year-old Lizel Margallo was Peter Scully's other girlfriend. She had also been taken in and groomed by him as a teenager and had a lot of responsibility running the business side of things. Like Carman, Lizel had no family and nowhere else to go. And Peter took care of her, gave her money and fancy clothes and made sure she stayed loyal to him. Despite being his sex slaves, Carman and Lysel both felt safe with Peter and believed he would never inflict pain on them as he did to his younger victims. At the time of his arrest, Lysel was living in a luxury condo in Cebu City in the Philippines. She actually had 16 outstanding warrants against her, but no one in her life knew anything about her crimes. She also went by the alias Shannon Carpio, and she had a group of friends she met at a fancy gym in the city. She spoke English well and seemed confident and educated. She had a passport in the name of Gina Carpio and told her friends Shannon was her stage name. 
She posted pictures on social media as Shannon Carpio and showed off her glamorous lifestyle. Believe it or not, she also went to church regularly. She did charity work and donated to causes like child hunger and homelessness. Her friends thought of her as caring and generous, and her personal trainer said she was soft-spoken and sweet. She claimed she was the wife of a French software millionaire. When she took her friends out for expensive dinners and drinks, she said the money came from her husband and people who loved her. But in fact, the money was actually coming from Peter Scully. From his jail cell, he continued communicating with Lysel through WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and Skype. And she continued running the production company and posting her core videos for No Limits Fun on the dark web. The National Bureau of Investigation, or MBI, in the Philippines labeled her as a savage, and she was a highly dangerous suspect and flight risk. But then finally, they were able to track her down and arrested her on January 25th, 2017, while she was on vacation in Malapascua Island with two British nationals. As she walked along the shore, she was suddenly surrounded by MBI agents, and the now 23-year-old was taken into custody. And she confirmed that Peter was still running the business from jail somehow. After her arrest, her friends were shocked, and no one suspected she was living a secret life as a pedophile and child abuser. A former friend posted a warning about her on Facebook and asked not to be judged for associating with such a monster. This woman had introduced Lysel to other friends and even to her own child. An hour after posting, though, she had to delete her Facebook because her account had been flooded with threatening messages. Peter Scully allegedly had at least one other female accomplice, Dorothea Chia Chi, also known as Althea Chia who was arrested in February 2017, just a month after Lysel. Three other men were arrested and charged for their involvement in the production company. A Filipino man named Alexander Lau, a Brazilian doctor named Haniel Caetano de Oliverio, and a German man named Christian Rauch. Other suspects have been identified but are still at large. After Peter's arrest, his indictment was postponed three times because he couldn't find an attorney to represent him. But he was finally indicted in June 2015. He met his attorney, Alejandro Jose Palugna, just once before his proceedings. Peter claimed that he had been molested by a priest when he was young and claimed he was only a passive participant in the business. It was Carman who really ran the show, and he had hoped to become a state's witness by turning against her. He pleaded not guilty, which forced at least 10 of his victims to testify against him and relive the trauma he put them through. During court hearings, Peter just laughed and joked about his crimes, and in jail he had a list of demands, including access to a cell phone and fresh beef, pork, and chicken for dinner. He tried to order specific meals like corned beef, pork and beans, and eggs. He also demanded a fan for a cell, because it said it got too hot for him. But thankfully all these requests were denied. A family member started contacting the jail to complain on his behalf, and demand he receive special treatment. In March 2015, 60 Minutes Australia journalist Tara Brown interviewed him from his jail cell, and he claimed he never victimized any children until after he fled Australia and had never harmed his own children. He explained that he's working on what he called a tell-all journal that will provide details about his crimes and his motivations. During the interview, he deflected several of Tara's questions by saying the answer will be in the journal and refused to say more. He tried to answer the question of why did he do these crimes and stumbled over his words before trailing off. Later, Tara asked him again why he raped young girls and again, he stumbled over his words before admitting he doesn't know but wants to figure it out so he can tell everyone. This entire time, he never expressed remorse or guilt for his actions. The death penalty was abolished for a second time in the Philippines in 2006 but Peter's crimes were so heinous that officials were calling for a reintroduction of capital punishment for him to be put to death by a firing squad. But the cases against Peter and Carman were complicated by two similar and suspicious events. In January 2015, shortly after Carman's arrest, the documents relating to her case were destroyed in a fire. Then, in October 2015, another fire destroyed the evidence room where all of Peter Scully's electronics that were seized were being stored. Many believe he paid off a police officer in order to destroy this evidence. 
Without the photos and videos proving his involvement, prosecutors feared the case would fall apart. And Peter just started acting like he was going to be set free. Because all they could charge him with was the kidnap and torture of Rosie and Queenie, the two cousins Carman had set free. He was charged with one count of human trafficking and five counts of rape. When news broke in Australia that Peter Scully had been given $500,000 of taxpayer money for his legal defense, people were outraged, and rightfully so. The money was provided by a federal program called the Serious Criminal Matter Scheme, which provides funding to Australians who face serious charges in other countries. Thankfully, his legal defense that he was a passive participant didn't work. And on June 13, 2018, he and Carman were both found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. However, he's still under investigation for multiple other crimes, including the murder of 11-year-old Cindy. Two years before Peter Scully was found guilty, Lux the dark web user who leaked Daisy's destruction was identified. Lux was also an Australian named Matthew David Graham. He was 22 at the time of his arrest, a nanotechnology student who lived with his parents in Melbourne and ran hurt to the core from his bedroom. He was sentenced to 15 years in jail for his crimes. With Peter Scully and Matthew David Graham behind bars, other dark websites have popped up to replace their content. Unfortunately, it's a never-ending cycle of abuse as entertainment. The most effective way to catch criminals is to go undercover, but in order to use these sites, police officers would have to upload child abuse content, which they obviously can't and will not do. Since Daisy's destruction was confirmed to be real, another video has taken its place. Dafu Love is rumored to be another hurt court video that's even more violent and grotesque than anything Peter Scully ever published. It supposedly started as a creepy pasta made up after Peter's arrest. And while many believe Dafu Love isn't real, plenty of people were positive that Daisy's destruction was just an urban legend. But as we know now, they were wrong. So that's where the story of Peter Scully ends. He's still rotting away in prison, which thank God he got life in prison. I mean, it seemed like there for a second that he had a possibility of doing way less time than that. I mean, the fact that Matthew Graham only got 15 years kind of blows my mind. It does. I mean, that should be way more severe punishment if you're you know, literally putting that kind of content out there. Yeah, yeah exactly. So uh, it's just times like these where it's like we need like the strictest punishment for these types of crimes. Yeah. The, the death by firing squad seemed like a suitable punishment for Peter Scully. Yeah. People, people do believe, though, like life in prison is much harder. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those endless debates. I mean, you, I know. I mean, I've seen. I mean, it's just like I feel because he is who he is and he's this white guy in the Philippines. He seems like he's getting some special treatment over there. Yeah. You know, the fact that they're, you know, he's tr able to make himself more comfortable and stuff is just such bullshit. Like, it is. Put him in a fucking box and let him just right. fucking rot. Like, if you're going to keep him alive, he should be in fucking, he should be, you know, in horrible conditions right. at least for the rest of his life. So that's what he that put he all of his victims to. Yeah, it's just like, it's know? just one of those things. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no right answer. No. I think everybody just has their own opinion as to what, what to do with people like this. But in my opinion, I think somebody like this, there's, I mean, there's no even purpose in letting them continue to live on this planet no, anymore. It's they don't just deserve like to breathe the same air. Way like, too far gone at that point. Yeah. There's no rehabilitating. There's no way he's going to ever be a productive member of society. I mean, this shit runs deep and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very, very, I don't know. I don't know if there's any way back from this. So I don't know. I mean, he's, he is where he is and hopefully he stays there, but it's just like, like I said, at the end of this, it's just a drop in the bucket. I mean, this stuff goes on yeah. all the time. There's all kinds of people out there that continue to make this type of content. I mean, there's right, the right. world of human trafficking and sex trafficking is truly just, it's just so terrible, man. It's just terrible that there's people that do this to other humans and it, it feels like helpless. It's like, what can you even do about it? The authorities can barely do anything about right. it. So like, as just a normal human being, what can you do about it other than 
be aware of it, I guess, you know, and it happens here in the U S too. It's not like this just happens in the Philippines. I mean, Mm. this happens all over the world and, and a lot of people that you would never suspect being involved in this kind of stuff are. And that's the, the craziest thing about it is it's like the most unsuspecting people you can think of are the most sick and dark and demented ones. So I don't know. I think it's just, it's important to, you know, tell these stories because it, it, you know, not only helps us remember those that went through these tragic, tragic lives that they had, but, you know, hopefully give you some awareness going forward. I mean, if you're a parent out there and yeah. you hear this kind of stuff that's done to young children, especially infants, it's just, it's, it's really, really hard to, yeah. to wrap your mind around that. And I know you and I aren't parents yet, but after hearing this whole story and previous stories and stuff, you know, it really is preparing us for ways we can keep our children safe out there yeah i mean just know? just being keeping an eye on your kids knowing what they're doing online seems like yeah one of the best ways you can do it now there's so many tools to help you kind of i mean i know that's one thing that kendall and i are always thinking about is like how we've had so many cases that we've covered and stories about people like like this and just knowing all the sick people that are online that are just hunting their predators literally looking for children to prey upon and so whatever you can do to try and protect your children you should do it and you know you know keep an extra good eye on them because yeah a lot of times they do you know lure them in through other people like he he wasn't doing it himself necessarily but he was using people that were unsuspecting these two Mm -hmm. women that you would never guess and they end up being the ones that are involved in it I've actually witnessed a a scenario where I was at a Walmart near I-70, which is Mm. one of the major highways in America. And I remember walking down the aisles and there was this woman, just this weird looking woman that was just walking around and like taught would just randomly come up to young women Mm. that were just like walking through there and being like, hi, I was wondering if you would want to come to my Bible study. Oh, wow. And just saying very, like very suspect things like that. Like obviously your first thought is like, you believe what she's saying that Mm. she's just some religious weirdo that's just trying to get you to you know go to her bible study at walmart recruiting people at walmart but then when you actually look into it more and you know that this is like a actual scheme they use to try Mm. and abduct people right that out in that parking lot at walmart there's a fucking van waiting to whisk you away Uh if you have if you happen to fall for this woman's you know this woman might seem like completely harmless but then she leads out to the parking lot before you know it you're getting swooped up into Uh a van and then you're on i-70 and you're never seen again and that's what's just so terrifying about is that it literally happens all the time it happens everywhere especially those big box stores because those parking lots are so big that it's so easy for people to just kind of blend in and you can have you know big vans and vehicles like that especially near highways yeah and and there's not enough cameras or security surveillance employees to watch at at all times right right so you're it's you're at risk right i mean unfortunately especially as a as a young female it's like even where it's the chances go up dramatically for you i mean they do take young men too but it's just like and children too that's what's scary too is that just terrifies me about like bringing i don't even know if i'd ever want to bring my kids to a walmart where if your kid like separates from you i mean it's so bit such a big store that like you if your kid wanders away from you it's very easy to lose them in a store like that and i couldn't even imagine as a parent like turning around your child is just gone and then you start like just the panic that sets in i know like when my pet gets out or i accidentally leave my pet outside or something the panic that sets in your heart drop it's just like oh yeah absolute sheer terror sets Mm -hmm. in and to have your kid or your wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend just like they were there one second the next second you turn around they're gone right it's just scary i mean it's at the end of the day this is all real this is not there's nothing fantasy about any of this this is the real shit that's going on in our world and the sick human beings that are doing this it's just it's unbelievable but i think it's better to know that it exists than to just pretend like everything is sunshine oh, and roses and every everybody loves each other everybody's kind oh. nobody wants to hurt each other but it's just not how things are no the cold dark reality of things is yeah, i mean you really can't trust strangers no i mean that's what i think that's like one of the perks of true crime is it does make you more aware of your surroundings it makes you 
not trust people as much and no uh, matter who they are what right, they're telling right. you they could be saying that they're they love jesus and they want you to come to their church service and they're lying through their teeth and they're actually a part of a human trafficking ring like right you know you just have to be careful out there it's, it's the bottom line and really try you know just watch look over your shoulder mm -hmm. look around you go with somebody else that's like the number one thing is like don't go places that you would perceive as sketchy by yourself right like that's just like a simple fact just you know buddy system really could save oh, your yeah. life so you know oh, yeah. go with somebody else if you can and i know not everybody has somebody that they can go do stuff with but but at least you know just be aware protect yourself now there's ways to personally protect yourself mm -hmm. there's you know you can get tasers on amazon you can get pepper spray yeah. whistles alarms even uh there's a lot of different uh protection devices online and you know for those that live in in places where you can conceal carry i mean you know if that makes you feel safer i, I in this world yeah and with that, all the things that happen i don't see how it's a bad idea to do that either you know you just never know so i'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up there that is the end of this episode i don't really know what else to say about it fuck this guy yeah fuck this guy and unfortunately he's just one of, of many but that is it for today's episode of lights out uh, if you're not subscribed already make sure you're subscribed on youtube and apple podcast but we will see you guys next time but until then lights out everybody <laughs>